Hey guys, Alex from Borgen Cove here, and today we're covering four giant sprawling epic Kickstarter campaigns that all have a large narrative focus. Now specifically those four games are going to be Tainted Grail by Awakened Realms, Treadvang Legends by Kaman, Otherfields by Awakened Realms, and Hell the Last Saga by Mythic Games. Now the reason I'm going into these is because in my video about Hell the Last Saga, which I'll link to up above, I had a few comments or questions about which of these did I back and why. And I thought it'd be interesting to just put together a giant roundup video covering those four games the pros and cons of each one, what called me, what called to me, what didn't call to me about each of these games, and ultimately, which ones did I back? Now, if you stick around to the end of this video, what, something new that I'm experimenting with, and we'll see how it plays out, is I will actually have a poll up that you can, well, down, I'll link to it down below, a poll where you can vote on what coverage you want me to do next. I'll have a bunch of topics or opinions that I plan on covering. Now, my usual, you know, anything time sensitive, anything like collection updates, specific Kickstarters, Kickstarter roundups, those are all time sensitive, so we'll all be done based on the time. But in terms of general topics, I will let you guys pick from a variety of topics in order to choose what I'm covering. As a heads up, these are all obviously topics I want to talk about, so they will probably all be covered at some point. You're basically just choosing the order they'll be covered in. Now, I will note, it does collect an email. I'll give you a heads up right now. I will not be using that email to spam you about Board Game Co. or anything like that. If I ever do use it, it will be specifically related to the YouTube channel or something to do with the YouTube channel. So in terms of that, I, feel, I understand if you still don't want to give it, totally fine. But if I ever use that email for anything, it will be YouTube related, not Board Game Co. related. Now, that being said, why is Seventh Continent up on my screen if this is not one of the games I'm actually covering? And the reason is because Seventh Continent is the baseline for why I'm willing to consider backing any of these to begin with. Uh, something I've talked about in my videos before, something I've talked about in blog posts or whatever, is I am not someone who generally appreciates the narrative aspect of gameplay. I am not someone who likes picking up a card and reading from it, Jen jumped from the boat and brandished his viking sword and sprinted towards the trees, do you whatever. I don't appreciate that in games. I'm not against it, but it always feels a little awkward to me whether I'm doing the reading or someone else. <clears throat> and so it's something that it has generally been a turnoff for me when I'm looking at a game and there's a huge focus on the narrative experience. I have, for the most part, not have great, not have, I have not had great experiences with narrative-driven games. I mean, my starting from my very first one was Tales of Arabian Nights, which was all about a choose-your-own-adventure board game, and I hated it. I absolutely hated it, despised it, and despised might be, <laughs> despised might be a strong word. My recollection was I would never play it again. It was a long time ago. It was my first year of gaming, and in general, that's been true across the board for whenever I have played a game that focuses on the narrative experience over the gameplay. I am someone who prefers the gameplay above all for the most part. I am someone who wants the gameplay and the strategy and the choices to be why I'm playing the game. Uh, either that or the laughs. Party games have a benefit in just terms of the sheer laughter they can bring out. Games like Coimbra, Food Chain Magnet, whatever, they all have the tense strategic choice. The narrative experience has generally been something that hasn't appealed to me, with one giant notable exception, and that's Seventh Continent. Seventh Continent was a game that I held off getting for a good two years after it became popular because it, looking at the, the gameplay, it looked like it was basically a choose-your-own-adventure. It was more exploration. Not really choose-your-own-adventure, just more... I guess there is an element of that too, but it was more exploration-based. While there certainly is gameplay, it is a far greater focus on the journey rather than the gameplay. Meaning there is an aspect of managing your hand, choosing which equipment to build, choosing which directions to go, although that's more just choices. The choosing which equipment does have more of a strategy choice, trying to optimize around what you do need, what you don't need, what the map has presented so far. There certainly is gameplay in Seventh Continent, make no mistake whatsoever. But it doesn't in any way match up to the gameplay in, you know, like I said, Food Chain Magnet, Coimbra, Blood Rage, Innis, any of the games that I thoroughly enjoy and love. I would argue it doesn't even hold up to the gameplay of lighter games that I enjoy and love, like Five Tribes, Kingdom Builder. Gameplay, the gameplay from the continent, I would argue is good, but not great. Not terrible, but certainly not great. But I love the game. And I can't tell you why I love the game as opposed to other games. I can tell you that Seventh Continent, there's less of a focus on reading cards that might be part of it. I don't know yet. But I thoroughly enjoy the experience it provides. I thoroughly enjoy the journey it provides. And this is the baseline for why I've been willing to back any game that focuses on what the epic narrative sprawl of a game is. Normally that'd be a turnoff for me, but because of Seventh Continent, I can say, you know what? I'll give it a chance. 
And so with that long, long introduction out of the way, I'll have timestamps below in case so you can skip all that stuff. Let's start with Tainted Grail. Tainted Grail was Awakened Realm's journey into the world that Seventh Continent did. Now, it's not the same world. I may have said that poorly, but rather... I would have a hard time believing that Tainted Grail wasn't in some way influenced by the success of Seventh Continent. Don't get me wrong, it is definitely its own experience. This is not some cheap knockoff that they tried to just capitalize on it, but rather they saw the success, I'm assuming they saw the success of Seventh Continent, and started building this epic sprawling world that has an aspect of similarity, enough to pull people in, and yet different enough to very much be its own beast in the genre. It has that card exploration display that Seventh Continent does. It has a gameplay aspect to it that is vastly different than Seventh Continent. It brings its own gameplay tweak to the, to the genre. It does have combat, more abstracted through the use of card play, and it is Awakened Realms, basic, their first exploration into this giant world of narrative-driven gameplay experiences. And it pulled me in. And I backed Tainted Grail. I backed it at the all, backed it at the all-in pledge. In fact, my only regret, I think, was probably not opting for the two-wave shipping. This would be a great game to have on my table right now with all the solo play and pandemic and quarantine going on. So Tainted Grail was a game that I went all-in on for three reasons. And we're going to go through these three reasons for each of the Kickstarters. Because I was trying to figure out which ones. For myself, I was trying to validate why I did or didn't back each of these at what pledge levels or whatnot. And Tainted Grail is one that I went all in on, like I already said, and I went on all in on it for three reasons. One is something that I've talked about in a lot of my videos. This is an Awakened Realms game, a heavily sought after Awakened Realms game, Awakened Realms game that raised nearly five million pounds, and it will hold its value. This is not a question, this is not a discussion, this is not up for debate. If you sell your Awakened Realms pledge level, whatever it might be, for less than the cost you paid plus shipping, you are doing yourself a disservice. Now, that specifically, that shipping cost is back doing, assuming you're a U.S. backer. In terms of international back backers, I have a harder time knowing the market, plus your shipping is more expensive. But if you are a U.S. backer and you sold this pledge any level for less than you paid plus shipping, that was a mistake and you did yourself a disservice. Now, if you did it as a favor to someone else, great, kudos to you. But if you did it because you didn't realize, these games hold their value. And so off offhand, Tainted Grail, the first starting baseline as to why I was willing to back this at an all-in pledge level is I was not worried about the cost aspect. Either I will like it, in which case I don't weigh the cost, I'm happy to own anything I like at whatever the cost might be, or I don't like it, in which case I'll be able to get my money back, so there's no risk factor going on there. The second aspect is the gameplay looked appealing. Now this is something that's coming in from the, the Seventh Continent, which I just mentioned, which is it has a large Seventh Continent baseline of exploration, of looking at the cards, of making choices, making decisions. And they substituted the equipment aspect of Seventh Continent. I would argue most of the decisions of Seventh Continent uh, revolve around the equipment you have. But in, seven, in Tainted Grail, they changed it very much. They have more of a stat-based system with your character. They do have battles. This definitely looked, I would argue, similar to Seventh Continent, looked on the weaker side. I know they drastically had to rehaul the combat mechanisms because those were too... Ne too eh, even for a game that wasn't was more focused on the narrative journey. But the gameplay overall looked appealing to me. It did not look like a game that I would guarantee I like, not by a long shot, but there was enough there to hook me in. And finally, the miniatures. The miniatures were not a draw for me. And I'm covering the miniatures because they were a draw in other campaigns. But the miniatures, while they weren't bad, not by a long shot, uh, these menus, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, these big statues that are on the board, don't pull me in at all. The Monsters of Avalon is kind of an optional expansion to throw monsters on the board, and the guys look okay. Awakened Realms in general has always been for me a company that I don't love their miniatures, whether it's uh, the Edge Dawnfall, whether it's Lords of Hellas, I always find their miniatures to be very interesting. They definitely provide a different spin compared to many other companies, but for whatever reason, that different spin does not come along with me loving them, it comes along with me thinking that they're nice. They're totally good. They're totally fine. The quality, end result quality, generally seems fine. I would say Nemesis probably has the ones I like the most just because of the genre it's in. But Awakened Realms minis tend to not do it for me. And so ultimately I back Tainted Grail for two of those three reasons. It would hold its value, and the gameplay looked appealing. Next up from there, we have Trudvang Legends. Trudvang Legends, I don't know because you know which one is next. I should probably check this before the video. Either Trudvang Legends or Etherfields was next in sequence. But either way, we'll start with Trudvang, and we'll go from there. Trudvang Legends was by Kaman, and this was a game that I actually planned on passing on at first. Kaman campaigns are games I generally back. I would say I back probably 80-90% of them. But I do pass on a few, and I thought Trudvang Legends would be one of those passes. 
But as the campaign went on, this world that they had, and it's not their world, it's the Trudvang RPG that they're adapting, but the, the world that they had and the gameplay that they were showing slowly but surely started growing on me. The miniatures, which at first were uh, not appealing to me, at first the differences from a standard, uh, standard fantasy trope were a bit of a turnoff for me initially. But the more they built the world, the more they showed stretch goals, the more they showed the expansion packs, the more I got behind these miniatures and started appreciating them, not for why they weren't like the ones I generally like, but rather why they were different from the ones I generally like. They provide a very different take on the standard miniatures you're going to see in a, in a, in a fantasy board game because of the the Celtic, I don't know if I'm doing it, which I don't know which genre they come from, whether it's Celtic, whether it's uh, whatever the lore is behind Trudvang, it definitely does produce a very unique miniature aspect to it. Not, not just the art in general, the art in general, I believe this is all done by Paul Bonner, if I'm not mistaken, but it was very different. And I liked the differences over time. This is a game that I ended up backing, not initially, but rather as the campaign progressed. Actually, I think I did back initially because I had an early bird pledge, but I planned on canceling and didn't. And so this was a game that I enjoyed the gameplay and the role that they were building as the campaign progressed, which is interesting and ironic because the campaign actually had a lot of uh, mid-campaign hiccups that they had to, uh, come on, had to adjust their tactics and strategy of how they were dealing with this campaign. Now, in addition to the miniatures, the, the gameplay looked very intriguing. Not necessarily amazing, but intriguing. And the specific aspect that intrigued me is this aspect of a board that remembers how the game was played. This was a game that you would play, you would have a journey, you'd have a, 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 an adventure in the game, and throughout that adventure, you'd be slotting these cards into these little plastic sheets on the board so that the board remembered aspects of things that had happened, and the game, the world you were enjoying, was being altered by your decisions. And I really appreciated that about the game. I really appreciated that about the experience it was building. Uh, in general, campaign games have this aspect of things carrying over to the next game, but this almost had a more legacy element. I find a game like uh, uh, Gloomhaven, which has a very strong game-to-game -game sequence, I find that that's more about building up your characters than building up the world. It definitely is world building, but I find it's more episodic with an overall arcing, you know, growth within the journey. Versus I really like the idea that each game of Trudvang I play might be different because of different choices I've made throughout the game. I believe it's called the Legend System, if I'm not mistaken. But I, I was very much pulled in by it. And again, I backed all in. This all in thing is going to be relevant for the other fields. We'll come back to that. But I backed all in. In general, I try to back all in because I have FOMO. I do have FOMO. I try to make decisions about which games I'm going in or not. But once I'm interested in a game, I tend to go all in. In Trudbank, that might have been a mistake, honestly. The return on your initial pledge compared to the return on your all in pledge, it's... It's a big gap. I mean, generally, you get a much better value for your main pledge. You'll, the expansions will hold their value, but it's not the same level of return. But a lot of the miniatures I liked the most were in the expansions, and so I got suckered in. As far as, let's come back to those three reasons. Why did I back uh, Trudvang? And the reason number one is I just covered. It will hold its value. Again, I have no qualms here. I have no uncertainty whatsoever. This is a game that will hold its value. This is a game that I will either keep and love, or I will sell it for more than I paid for it, or the same as I paid for it. Number two, the gameplay looked appealing. And again, similar to similar to uh, Trudva, similar to Tainted Grail, it's not that I think I will love the game, but rather there are enough aspects of the gameplay that I am pulled in. Uh, for instance, the chip building aspect, I'm actually not on board with bag building and chits in general. I generally have the opinion that when companies do that, when games do that, it's not because it's an ideal mechanic, but rather it's because they're trying to differentiate themselves from rolling dice. Generally, that's my opinion. I'm sure sometimes having a binary choice is better than having a, a dice, but it often feels a little bit clumsy to throw a bunch of chits. Uh, this is a game that obviously Runebound has this 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 chit system. Uh, Isophorian Guard that was at the, coming out at the same time as this game had that system. I think they're I think it's okay. I don't have a problem with it. I just find it slightly more clumsy and awkward than dice, and I'm okay with it. But it's certainly not something that's a draw. So ultimately, I was intrigued by the gameplay without being completely sold by it. But that can be enough considering the fact that a game holds its value. And number three, the miniatures. I really, really enjoyed the miniatures, which I didn't initially, but as the campaign progressed, as I got drawn into what this game is giving you, I really enjoyed the miniatures for how they were different from the standard games I back. And that's why I back Trudmang. It hit all three of my checkboxes in that sense. From there, we move to Otherfields. Otherfields is a game by Awakened Realms again, 
that was very different than than Tainted Grail. Where Tainted Grail clearly had a mirror to Seventh Continent, Etherfields was pitching itself as a, a dream story, a story sequence or something like that. Basically, you're going through these dream sequences, and there is, similar to what similar to the games I mentioned until now, it has a strong gameplay aspect, but also a strong narrative aspect, a strong making choices based off all the cards, based off all the things that are happening in the game. And I did not back other fields. And I, I do have doubts about that, and yes, I am 100% aware of this late pledge button here, and I haven't made a decision yet. We'll see how that plays out. But the reason I passed on other fields is for a variety of reasons. Let's start with the baseline. Etherfields will hold its value. It will, again, I'm not concerned about this. It's a game, it's by Awakened Realms, it's a miniature game, large exploration. Unless it totally bombs, it will hold its value. In terms of the gameplay, I wasn't pulled in. Despite watching multiple gameplay videos and trying to go through how the game played out, at no point did I have a cohesive idea of how the game actually played. I, I watched them, but I didn't, gather what was actually happening and so I kind of ended up passing on it because there wasn't enough gameplay there to pull me in and the third reason is the miniatures while very unique and very appealing in different ways they had a lot of intriguing miniatures I mean the she-wolf over here gorgeous looking miniature but despite being gorgeous despite me recognizing how what a quality product this miniature looks like or at least the the 3d the 3d sculpt it just didn't pull me in Personally, again, like I said, Awakened Realms miniatures for some reason generally just don't do it for me. And I can't define why. They manage to be different and unique, but not the kind of different and unique that I like. And so, Awaken Realms, and, and, and other fields, it only checked off two of my boxes. I'm sorry, one. It checked off one of my three boxes. It would hold its value, but the miniatures were not appealing to me, and the gameplay was not appealing to me. Despite that, by the way, I am having second thoughts which I already covered. And despite that, and that's because ultimately, to me, what matters most is does a game hold its value? If it does, then I'm basically trading my money temporarily for a game that I will likely be able to sell for a profit if it's not good, and I'm happily keep it if it is good. Those second two reasons shouldn't matter nearly as much as they do. That being said, I do have a hard time backing a campaign purely from the value aspect. The only reason it is giving me that second pause, that second thoughts, the pause, is because it's not that the gameplay won't be good, it's that I'm not seeing anything that's appealing. It may very well be good. If this was a genre of games that has I absolutely knew I wouldn't like the gameplay, then the value would be a meaningless concept. But the fact that the gameplay looks different, interesting, might be good, but might not be good, I don't really know, it's hard for me to say whether I should or shouldn't back it. In the end, the reason I haven't hit Late Pledge, the reason I didn't back it, is because of those two other aspects. Which is, one is, this is another epic sprawling game, and I only have so much time to play these epic sprawling games. And so to a certain extent, I'd rather commit my time to those that I believe will hold my attention more, to those that I'm more pulled in by. And two is because I'm a sucker for all-in pledges. I really don't like feeling like I didn't get everything. That's a problem, by the way. I'm going to cover this in other videos, but that is 100% a problem. I should not be using my FOMO of content that I will never need, never get to, to stop myself from backing a game. But it's definitely there. It is illogical. It is wrong. I would tell you that you should ignore this advice, and you should ignore this advice. But I like the all-in campaigns, and I don't know if I can justify an all-in pledge on a game that I am simply not pulled in by. If I do late pledge, I probably will late pledge for the core box alone. We'll see how that plays out. I'll update you if I ever do. But for right now, I passed on it because the value alone was not enough for me. I need to in some way be pulled in by the gameplay or the miniatures. Which brings us to the last one on this list, Hell the Last Saga. Now, if you've watched my videos, you already know, Hell the Last Saga is a game that I backed. I did not go all-in on this because the all-in was a bunch of extras I didn't care about. They weren't gameplay. I, my FOMO for all-in generally extends to gameplay all-in, not to extras all-in. Uh, I believe I did back one of the extras. I have to double-check which one. Was it the dice? I backed one of the extras. I remember that, but I didn't get the rest of them. I didn't feel the need for them. The base pledge was more than enough for me. Hell the Last Saga. You can watch my full thoughts in my Hell video, which I linked to at the beginning of this video. Overall, this this seemed to be Mythic Games' introduction to this narrative role. They wanted to get in on that buzz and hype that, ex that surrounds these style of games. And don't get me wrong, again, I don't mean that's a cash grab, not in the slightest. Could be an amazing game. These games take a long time to develop, but this is a Mythic Games' first introduction to a largely narrative-driven experience. 
the gameplay to me looked utterly dull. Utterly dull. I can't remember. I mean, I generally don't find gameplay videos engaging, even for games I know I love. Mage Knight is a game I know I know that I love. But watching people play Mage Knight is it's just beyond mind-numbingly boring for me. For me, at least. And I find that for games I don't know how to play, that's even more boring because at least I don't even understand the tenseness of the decision you're making. I'm just watching people slowly do things that don't make enough sense to me. And Hell the Last Saga, while the gameplay looked terrible to me, the miniatures looked gorgeous. Let's start with that. Now, don't get me wrong, you should never back a campaign just for the miniatures, unless you like miniatures, I guess. For myself, I use miniatures in games. And so I don't really just put miniatures on myself and don't play them. I have to have a reason they are they have a per they have to have a purpose for me to use them. So if I don't like this game, it doesn't matter how good the miniatures are, this certainly will be a game I sell or trade. Which brings us to point two, which is holds its value. This is a game that will hold its value. I have no qualms about that. I will play an exploration or two as soon as I get it. Well, even if I need to do it solo, I don't really care. But to validate whether it's a game that I like, to validate whether it's a game for me, I will certainly play this when it first comes out. And from there, if I like the gameplay, then great. It will hold, that, like I said, multiple times now. I will pay whatever you want for a game that I enjoy. Versus if it's a game that I don't like, I will turn around and sell it for what I paid or more without worry about that. So the miniatures is a draw. The reason I back this game is the combination of holding its value plus the miniatures. And finally, the last reason I was willing to back it is it, those two alone would not be enough because I'm not wasting my time reading a rule book and playing a game just because I like the miniatures. But rather, there were enough positive comments from people who played the game that I do hold out that this might be a good game. I'm uncertain. Some of those playthroughs looked utterly beyond dull. It is hard to tell you how boring they looked unless you watch them. And the flip side to that is it was Tabletop Simulator. These weren't live gameplay sessions and they lacked that spark that you might typically see. So I was willing to give them a lot of credence to the fact that it didn't look like an amazing gameplay experience. Even Nemesis, for instance. Nemesis, which is a great game by, by most metrics. Not everyone enjoys it, but it's a well-rated, well-liked game. Watching tabletop simulator games of that as well, not really inspiring. Better than hell, but not by much. It is hard to get a good gauge of a game by watching a playthrough. It is harder if you don't know the game, and it's harder if it's on tabletop simulator as opposed to in real life. Those are definitely all things that will contribute to a negative gameplay video. I am hopeful that Hell will be good, but I don't know yet. And so that's basically it. That's why I backed or didn't back each of these. Once again, quick roundup, Tainted Grail will hold its value, gameplay was engaging, miniatures not so much. Treadvang Legends hit it on all three. Game Hold its value, gameplay looked intriguing, miniatures really pulled me in. Other fields would hold its value, but the gameplay and the miniatures did not pull me in enough, and it just, I have too many of these games to risk it just for the, the value aspect. And Hell the Last Saga, not only was the gameplay not intriguing, I would argue the gameplay looked dull, and it will hold its value, and the miniatures were great. So I'm risking it, but I really do think, I do think there's a strong chance Hell will not stay in my collection. I'm hoping to be wrong, but, and if it doesn't, by the way, don't take it as a strike against Hell. The starting baseline, as I started this whole video with, the starting baseline is narrative-driven games, in general, are not my cup of tea. The ones I like so far have been the exception and not the rule. I don't know whether we'll, what will play out for all of these. I don't know what Tentagrill will be like, what Treadline Legends, what Etherfield, or what Hell the Last Saga will be for my collection. That's basically it. Those are these campaigns. That's why I backed it. Like I said, there'll be a poll down below in terms of what video I'll be doing next. The options on this week's poll will be the ethics of buying Kickstarter purely to resell for profit. Something I've touched upon briefly in a bunch of my videos. I talk about the value proposition. I don't talk about specifically buying to resell. Lots of people don't like it. They find it kind of scummy. I am totally fine with it in most cases, and I'll go into that and the reasons and the background and all that in that video. Second choice is games I haven't played in a year, but I'm still keeping. Those are games that I haven't played in over a year. There's still, what's it called? There's not a ton of them. There's like maybe 15 of them. I have to double check the list. But there's 15 games or so in my collection that I haven't played in more than a year. But I'm going to explain why these games that aren't seeing the table are still played, and I'll go over each one, and Chaos in the Old World is on that list. I got a lot of comments in my Risk video, I'll link to that, about why I didn't talk about Chaos in the Old World, and it's because I haven't played it in a long time, but I do think it's an amazing game. And the third option is the fastest three ways to save, the fastest, the easiest 
three changes you can make to save money while growing your collection. These aren't, you know, magical choices where you click on a link and people pay you whatever. Rather, these are just three practical ways to be in the board game world and to continue to grow your collection and continue to love and dive into this hobby while saving money on three easy tips. And those tips should be avoid Kickstarter, but that's not one of them. Those will be the choices. Feel free to jump down in the poll below. Feel free to comment and subscribe on these videos as usual. I'm Alex from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this comparison of these epic campaign games and why I'll be backing them and not backing. Seventh Continent, well, the next question would be Seventh Citadel. When that comes out, will I be backing it? And the answer is a strong, I hope not. I probably will, but I hope not. I just, I don't understand how I will ever get through the Seventh Continent content I already have. And that would just be more FOMO of stuff to add to my shelf just because... Because I have I have issues. I have issues. We'll talk about that some other time. In any case, those are the three videos. Um, those are the three options down below. You can go to the poll to vote. I'm getting a little rambly towards the end here. Until next time, have a good one.